We will hear an explanation of the workings of our local and state courts, how the federal courts work, and the role of the Supreme Court in our court system. After the presentations, we'll have time for questions from the audience, some of which, which have been submitted in advance. If you wish to ask a question, please write your question on the index card that you got when you came in. If during the presentations you think of a question and write it down, just put your hand in the air and one of our ushers, who are high school students, will be, uh, gather them up. Or if you want to get a card, put your hand up you know, so that they'll get you an index card. We will try to get to all the questions before the session is over. And I hope everyone received, um, when they came in, a copy of the Constitution and a flyer about women in the judiciary, thanks to Judge Louise Knight. So, our panelists tonight will each make a brief presentation explaining the specific level of our court system. But before we get started, let me introduce our wonderful panel. Mary Beth Clark Esquire is a litigation attorney with over 30 years administrative trial and appellate experience in the federal and state courts, primarily in New Jersey. She is a graduate of the University of Virginia School of Law, clerked in the United States District Court for the District of New Jersey, and is licensed in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. She previously worked in the Public Information Office at the Supreme Court of the United States, and she is a board member, we're very proud to say she is a board member of the League of Women Voters of the Lewisburg area. The Honorable Louise Knight has served for 11 and a half years as a judge on the Pennsylvania Court of Common Pleas for the 17th District, serving Snyder and Union Counties. She is currently a senior judge for the Court of Common Pleas, working part-time for various trial courts throughout Pennsylvania. Judge Knight has served as the first woman judge in her judicial district. Prior to becoming a judge, she practiced law for 29 years and was the first practicing woman attorney in Union County. From 1975 to 1999, she was an adjunct professor at Bucknell University teaching business law in the management department. Judge Knight is a graduate of George Washington University Law School. Fred Martin Esquire served as assistant U.S. attorney for the Middle District of Pennsylvania from 1978 until 2012, handling both civil and criminal matters. matters. Prior to that, he worked for various divisions within the United States Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. Fred has argued cases before three different U.S. Courts of Appeals and is licensed in Pennsylvania and Maryland. From 2003 to 2017, he served as an adjunct professor of criminology and criminal justice department at Lycoming College, and he is a graduate of the Georgetown School of Law. So first, Mary Beth Clark will make a brief presentation giving an overview of the concept of separation of powers as outlined by our Constitution. to both the League and the Daily Item for having us yep. here. Yep. I thought I could scream Oh, okay, but it's not. Um, thank you to the Daily Item and the League for having us here tonight. Um, I'm just going to take a few short minutes to put this program in perspective with the ones that have gone before it, um, before I turn it over to Judge Knight. Um, in particular, I want to put it in perspective to the two prior programs, the one on local government and state and federal government. Both of those programs dealt with our executive and legislative branches. Um, so let's just do a summary back from our early years in social studies. Um, the US Constitution set up three branches of government. Article one established the legislature um, to make the laws. That would be Congress. Um, there's also a state legislature. Article 2 is the executive branch, and it enforces the laws, and that at the federal level is the president, at the state level would be a governor, um, at the local level it would be a mayor. Article 3 set up the judiciary, or the judicial branch, which interprets the laws. Um, we have both trial and appellate courts that are Article 3. Um, the courts are the place where you, the citizens, come to challenge the laws Congress and your state legislatures make, and the president and the governor enforces, okay? And that concept is called judicial review. The purpose of having these three branches of government was to maintain some independence. But our founding fathers had more in mind than independence. They built a very complex but intentional system that included two concepts, separation of powers and checks and balances. 
And the idea of separation of powers is that government functions best when its powers don't rest in a single authority, but are divided among and shared by different branches of government. So it's a limit on any one branch exercising the power of another branch, but it also prevents concentration of power in any one branch of government. So no one has majority rule. And if you think about it, it made sense considering what was going on in our country at the time and what our founding fathers were trying to get away from. Um, but the purpose of separation of powers was to allow for checks and balances. And what that means is we had to control who had what power and how much. So each branch of government checks the power of the other branches to keep the branches balanced. So each branch is otherwise restrained by another. And, and let me give you a couple of very simple examples. So Congress passes a law. That then goes to the president, who can either sign it into law or veto it. Now, Congress can override that veto under a supermajority. But the Supreme Court can also decide whether or not that law is unconstitutional. So each of the three branches of government can have some role in determining what becomes law and what remains a law. Um, the founding fathers were also very um, strategic in how they decided issues such as employment of the, of the third branch of government. The first two branches of government, our legislature and our executive branch, are elected. The third branch is appointed. Um, and, but it's appointed by the president with the advice and consent of the Senate. So two other branches of government have something to say about who becomes a judge under Article Three in the federal court system. However, once approved, a federal judge under Article Three serves for life and cannot have his, his or her salary diminished. So it was a very intentional and complex system that was set up by our founding fathers. And that's so that we had checks and balances and separation of powers. So understanding that the courts have a very important role in our system of government, we're now going to move on to the whole meat of this evening's program to talk about our different court systems. So I'm going to turn the program over to Louise Knight, who is going to talk about our state and local courts. It's like technological transfer going on right now. <laughs> with a pro. With a pro. Good. Good to go? Yeah. All right. Well, my, I'm just going to Good evening. I'm pleased to be here. Yep, it's Mike. I will. <laughs> Good evening. I'm pleased to be here, and I'm grateful to the uh, league for having. Make sure we're going here, Meredith. I think I need you to check my list. <laughs> oh, there we go. There okay. Go. Oh, we're getting busy. Sorry. So, just a, a, a word of introduction. First of all, thank you to the League of Women Voters for inviting me to participate tonight. I'm pleased to be here and see so many friends and familiar faces. Uh, I am senior judge. I just want to explain something here, clean up these pictures. Um, it sounds like a high title, <laughs> senior judge, but what it really is, is, you know, I'm old and they want to kind of phase me out. And I have the equivalent status of what I call, I, I analogize myself to a substitute teacher. I get to show up to work, but I don't get to have any strategies about the policy or anything like that. But I've, I've enjoyed the job very much uh, up to this point. So I've got pictures up here of the two courthouses for the judicial district in which I preside, which is the 17th Judicial District. And some of you may recognize these buildings. Um, the one on the left is Union County Courthouse down on South 2nd Street, and the one to the right is the middle, the uh, Center County Courthouse in Middleburg. And Middleburg is sufficiently small that I don't even have to tell you the address. You just turn up at the intersection and you'll see the courthouse. Um, I want to start off with a challenge for all of you. Tonight is about the Constitution and the court system. And as mentioned, there is available out there a pocket 
uh, copy of the United States Constitution. You can carry it around in your pocket, your purse, whatever you want. Flip, you know, flip it out whenever you need to poke from it. Um, but I want to see how clued in you all are to the language of the Constitution. So I have a little test for you. And this will be with a show of hands. So let's start off. Excerpt from the Constitution. <coughs> All men are created equal, but they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. How many of you would vote that this is from the United States Constitution? Hands up. You spot a trap, perhaps. <laughs> Does anybody know where this phrase appears? <laughs> the what? <laughs> That's very good. And do you know when the Declaration of Independence was ratified by the United States government? What do we celebrate every July 4th? The ratification is July 4th, 1776. It was actually not actually July 4th, but 1776. The Constitution, when was the Constitution ratified? 87. Many years later, actually. All right, here's the next one. From each according to his ability, to each according to his need. How many votes that that is in the United States Constitution? You're all too wary here. Does anybody know? Does anybody know where this phrase goes? sounds like the Constitution, doesn't it? Don't these both sound like the Constitution? Anybody know where that came from? Oh, it's Karl Marx. <laughs> the Communist Manifesto, 1875. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's the next one. The consent of the government. In the Constitution? Yeah, I think so. Are, are you raising hands or are you just talking? Okay, hands up. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> That's the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> See, you all are really studied in the ways of our government. Okay, here's one. You probably get this one. Of the people, by the people, and for the people. How many say U.S. Constitution? No. Oh, no, no. Oh, I asked that. <laughs> okay, we've got a few. Thank you for being so honest. That's, that's wrong, actually. This is from the Lincoln's Gettysburg Address in 1863. So I don't know. You have to rate yourselves on this one. But it's interesting. You know, how much we all recognize about the United States Constitution. Okay, so what I've got up here for you to look at is a depiction of the Pennsylvania Supreme uh, Pennsylvania court system. And you'll see at the top of the pointer here, our Supreme Court, two appellate courts, which I'll mention in a minute, the common police courts, that's me, and below me, you know, I'm happy to say that I'm not the bottom, <laughs> uh, are some special courts. Our magisterial district judges, Philadelphia Municipal Court, Philadelphia Traffic Court, and Pittsburgh Municipal Court. These courts exist because of the size of Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, uh, that they're, they have such a volume of cases in these areas that they have to have special courts set up for that. Um, the, um, I'll just track this down. In our Supreme Court, our state Supreme Court, we have nine justices, and the, the uh, handout that I have for you tonight will tell you what I think is interesting, that we have three women uh, in the Supreme Court, two of them which, two of whom just recently retained for a second tenure term. Let me sure who was. Sorry, folks. There you go. Okay. Um, we have Superior Court, which is the second tier here, and I'll talk about how these courts work. We have 15 judges, and interestingly, we have uh, eight of the judges are women, and five are men, there are two vacancies. And then below that, we have the Commonwealth Court, which has nine judges. Here we have five women and four men, which I think is interesting. Coming down to the common pleas courts, we have a much uh, different number we have, um, as it says, 451 judges, only about 31% are women. There's 60 judicial districts in Pennsylvania, and seven counties are part of a multi-county judicial district. So Snyder County and Union County, because we're little, 
form one judicial district, where Philadelphia and Pittsburgh are all by themselves because they're so uh, highly populated. Then we have the special courts, as mentioned, uh, with um, the uh, MDJs, and then we have these municipal traffic courts, which have lots of different numbers. Well, the thing that will be of interest to you is the cases, most people have relationships with the magisterial district judges. These courts are designed as entry levels for certain kinds of disputes, such as small claims, landlord tenant, and criminal cases will usually initiate in the magisterial district judge court. From there, they will travel uh, on an appeal, if people want to take an appeal, up to the common police courts. Now, the common police courts are what we call the courts of original jurisdiction. They're the courts where things begin. And most cases, uh, in, sorry, most cases begin in this court, which is where I am. And we'll talk in a minute about what kinds of cases are heard by this court. Every case, the, the Superior Court is an appellate court for most of the cases um, that come to the Common Police Courts, with the exception of cases that involve any kind of governmental agency. So, for example, if there's a lawsuit against um, the Department of um, uh, Environmental Resources or something like that, that's a case that on appeal, it might originate here, but it will go up to the Commonwealth Court on appeal. Every case of originating in the Common Police Courts has an absolute right of appeal to that first level appellate court. So those courts are very, very busy. When you get up high to the Supreme Court, cases coming from the Commonwealth Court and the Superior Court only go there if the Supreme Court is interested in hearing them. Uh, or if it's a death sentence case, those will go up. So just to give you now an additional perspective here, um, we are the, and I'm sorry that this uh, highlighting is kind of smudged here, but here we are, Union of Cyber Counties, little guys, if you look at the whole of the state. And of course, as I'll talk about in a minute, we, that's, our bound, that's our boundary for authority. So cases that arise within Union or Snyder County are confined to those courts of common pleas. And every county has its jurisdiction defined that way. So Fred Martin will make you aware of how broad, in comparison, the jurisdiction is of the federal trial courts compared to what we have. We are, as I say, just little, little guys. So what kinds of things do we hear, and how are we different from the federal courts? Um, courtroom picture. As stated, our jurisdiction, which means our authority to act, the trial court's authority to act, is limited to anything happening within our county borders. And you saw a moment ago how small we are. So only things arising within that very narrow uh, geographic area is something that's heard by the trial courts. The other thing I would say about the state court system is we are centered on individual rights and duties involving those kinds of things that all of us are familiar with. Criminal and civil cases, so it would be personal injury cases, an auto accident on Interstate 80, a uh, contract dispute with someone arising within the borders of our small county area. We do delinquency, dependency, domestic relations matters, which includes custody, divorce, support, paternity, adoption. We do marriage ceremonies. Uh, we do protection from abuse cases, guardianships, estate matters, real property disputes, and appeals from that very low rung of the judiciary, the magisterial district courts. So I like to think of uh, our jurisdiction as being very personal. Uh, we don't get, as you'll see when Fred Martin talks, the big bombshell cases. The most, the closest we get to deciding constitutional issues is something in a criminal case where there's an issue of search and seizure, for example, or a violation of due process or something like that. But our decisions are limited to deciding whether a person's right to be protected by the Fourth Amendment has been violated in a particular case. We don't get to decide 
uh, whether you know the Fourth Amendment is uh, uh, something of constitutional magnitude. We just simply don't get to that kind of thing. We don't get to decide very often whether legislation is uh, proper under the Constitution. Those kinds of big deal questions really go to the federal court. So we're very personal, very individualized, and that's how our authority works. We have some specialized courts. Under our Supreme Court, there is a Judicial Conduct Board and the Court of Judicial Discipline, which is the entity that regulates people like me. If we misbehave, we will be dealing with those entities. This is a disciplinary board which deals with attorneys who would violate the uh, code of professional conduct in some way. And we have the Board of Law Examiners, which is the entity that licenses uh, people to become lawyers once they graduate from law school. We also have something that is new and significant called treatment courts. And I want to mention this in particular. Um, for Union and Sider County, starting in 2008, we began a DUI treatment court, and we now have a drug court. Oh, excuse me, we began a drug court, DUI court, then we have now have a drug court. We're hoping maybe at some point to be moving into the uh, veterans courts and the mental health courts. Um, this is a concept of diversionary uh, justice, whereby people can avoid going to jail by being enrolled in these treatment court programs which provide a period of very intense supervision for individuals who qualify and they have to engage in you know, weekly reporting to the court in front of a judge to assure the court that they are complying with their program goals. They have to do uh, all kinds of things, job searches, uh, there, may, there may be an educational component, there may be a counseling component, a health treatment component, uh, all designed to intensely focus on individuals who might otherwise be uh, afoul of the criminal court system and serving time as jail. Uh, just as a point of interest, to confine somebody in a, in a jail, a Pennsylvania jail, <coughs> runs about $26,000 a year. To put someone in state prison is about $62,000 a year. And of course the individual is non-productive in that period of confinement. So what drug courts are doing is giving, and DUI courts and the other courts, giving people a chance to get straightened out without going to jail and with getting the kind of necessary support and help that they need to stay out of trouble. And our, um, our, DU, our drug court for Snyder Union Counties, this drug treatment court, was uh, awarded uh, last year uh, a, a award uh, as a national mentor court, meaning that we are a model for others to follow who are looking to develop their own treatment courts. It's an exciting new concept, uh, and uh, we hope to see it even expand further. So it's a wonderful thing. Well, I had to put this cartoon up. It's my <laughs> closing comment um, about jury selection. This is how many people have used jury selection. <laughs> when we, um, just for your information and in comparison to what Fred will tell you, when we pick juries for criminal or civil cases, criminal cases are ones in which the government is alleging a person committed a criminal act. The civil case is a private dispute. Uh, we can only pick juries from within our county boundaries. So it's a very small Entity. And one of the things I always find amusing is, you know, we might have a very significant civil lawsuit involving a, you know, 10 car pileup on Interstate 80 because it's, you know, the parts of 80 are within Union County's uh, boundaries. That case heads over to our court. And we might get some very sophisticated attorneys out of Philadelphia or Pittsburgh or Scranton or whatever. And they come in to do jury selection and we end up, uh, let's say, summoning people who let, for example, let's say that the, uh, the uh, victims in the car accidents were treated at Evan Hospital. And the attorneys from these large law firms in these big cities will ask the question of the prospective jurors, do you have, uh, asking about the list of witnesses, which include doctors and nurses from Evan, do any of you uh, know Dr. So-and-so or nurse so-and-so and so, and all these names go up. <laughs> And the, judge, the attorneys come rushing up to the bench and say, Your Honor, 
I've got to disqualify these people based on their cause. They're going to be biased. And they're so used to the process in Philadelphia or Pittsburgh where easily, if that kind of connection is established, the trial judge will say, yes, we'll get rid of them. Well, up here, we have to say, listen, you want a jury or not? <laughs> um, and we have to ask the follow-up question, which is, in spite of the fact that you are a patient of Dr. So-and-so, who happens to be a witness in this case, do you feel you could be fair and impartial? And, you know, it's amazing. People will answer yes, and they can be. They can be fair and impartial. So those attorneys, they have a rule awakening, but we have a very different standard for thinking uh, juries here than the big cities do. Um, and we've had, I, I'm so impressed by the jury system, particularly as how it's uh, appeared to me in our Union County, Assigner counties. Um, the, the people are really capable of being fair and impartial and being objective. So my pitch is, if you would like to be a juror, <laughs> actually, how many of you have ever been a juror, either federal or state court? Lots of hands. Okay, so you, you've had the experience. If you want to be a juror, we'll be glad to put you in the pool. That doesn't mean you get picked. I have to make that distinction. That's something that has to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. But we have, um, I think, a very open-minded and uh, good uh, citizenship here in our two counties, uh, where I've seen you know, the most open-minded and fair treatment of individuals that uh, one could imagine by jurors. And the jury experience is transformative. Uh, I, I always talk to juries after a trial, and they all say, you know, they started out hating this whole thing. I don't want to be tied up for two days and, you know, for this whole thing. And at the end, if they've served, they say they were really glad they did it, that they learned a lot, and they valued the experience tremendously. So anyway, that's my pitch for jury service. And with that, I'm going to uh, turn the program over to Fred Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I too am pleased to. Uh, <coughs> I too am happy to be here and share what knowledge I have uh, about the federal court system. Uh, again, some of you probably who raised your hands in answer to Judge Knight's question whether you were uh, ever federal or state jurors. Maybe there are a few federal jurors. Are there any of you out there? So you made the long trek to Williamsport, because uh, that's the only place where federal jurors are selected. Uh, that, again, is one reason to be interested in my topic, which is inferior courts. And uh, I don't feel inferior just because that's my topic, but uh, inferior courts are the lifeblood before you get to the rarefied atmosphere that Mary Beth will tell you about in the Supreme Court. Uh, these are the working courts. They may not work as hard as Judge Knight, but they, they do their best to keep up. Uh, again, the inferior courts, uh, and you've heard Mary Beth talk about Article 3. This is the infamous Article 3, which is of the three branches of government, the judiciary gets the less amount of ink, which is perhaps most appropriate. And they talk about the Supreme Court and inferior courts. There is more, though, than an Article III court, and sometimes you'll hear about them. Uh, and as Judge Knight said, her practice was very, very close to day-to-day -to -day living. Uh, divorces, uh, estates, uh, accidents, although there's accidents in the federal system as well. The federal court system is very, very arcane and esoteric. The more arcane and everything must relate, of course, to what the federal government is entitled to work with. And the federal government, among other things, works with the military. And it works in international trade. And federal contracts. And veterans. And immigration. None of those topics, Judge Knight, 
Maybe she'd be interested in ruling on them, but she can't rule on them. And they don't involve Article III courts. They're all Article I judges, Article I courts. They do not have to go through the process of Senate confirmation. They do not have life tenure. They're a little niche or boutique practice of law uh, that, again, is not generally the lifeblood, and those types of cases generally will not go up to where Mary Beth's uh, friends are in the Supreme Court. But know that there are, again, people say, what's well, Article One or Article Three? Now you know Article One is different. It's a pigeonhole, a rather rarefied practice. What I experienced was the Article Three courts, and they begin generally with the courts of appeals. And with any luck at all. Hit the arrows. There's the Court of Appeals. There are 12 of them. Uh, when I practiced, or began my practice of law in the 1970s, by the way, I went to law school with uh, 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 Paul Manafort. Uh, he went his way, and I'm with you today. <laughs> Paul stayed around D.C., and I did for a little while, too. But um, seriously, with the Courts of Appeals, there are, up until the 1980s, there were 11 Courts of Appeals. Then it became too much of an overload of work between the 5th and the 11th circuits. There was a great deal of backlog of cases. So Congress split them, created a new Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, and in doing so, reduced the, uh, uh, the backlog of cases. You have heard in the last 10 months or so talking about courts of appeals, and some of them have reputations. When I worked in the Department of Justice back in the early 70s, it was always a good thing. We felt good when a case arose out of the 5th or the 11th circuits. Those judges, not always, but generally, are more conservative in their ju judicial viewpoint. By the same token, if you went to the Ninth Circuit, where much of the litigation early in the tenure of President Trump has arisen, it was the liberals, the land of fruits and nuts. That's what we used to call it in Washington. <laughs> uh, and again, there's nothing wrong with it. It's a tradition. It isn't always that way. There are conservative panels. For each circuit, there are maybe 13 to 15 judges because you have the courts of appeals don't hear criminal cases. They don't have juries. Uh, what they do is hear oral arguments, and sometimes they don't even have oral arguments, but it's a three-judge panel that hears a case on appeal. Uh, the chief judge usually designates who works on what cases, and uh, it's uh, a situation where Briefs are read, submitted, if there are questions of law, and it's just dealing with law that you deal with in the courts of appeals, whether it's constitutional law, statutory law, or some violation of federal law. And uh, again, starting at the top, the First Circuit meets in Boston. Second Circuit, where I argued one case, New York City. Ours is the Third Circuit, the circuit in which you live, in which you find yourself is comprised, as they say up there, New Jersey, Delaware, uh, and uh, Pennsylvania, as well as the Virgin Islands. Now, it, if you see some of these uh, uh, interesting courts, uh, Boston goes down to Puerto Rico. That's a nice place to visit and have certain oral arguments, <laughs> at least before the hurricane. Um, and uh, again, the judges from the Court of Appeals of Philadelphia especially during the winter months, never mind going down to the Virgin Islands and hearing arguments there. Uh, the Fifth Circuit, it used to go down to the Gazette Canal Zone until that was uh, returned back to uh, their, that country. Uh, so again, we've got uh, Richmond that does the Fourth Circuit. Fifth Circuit is New Orleans. Sixth Circuit is Cincinnati, where I also argue the case. Seventh Circuit, Chicago. Eighth is St. Louis. Ninth, San Francisco. Tenth, where Justice Gorsh was, is in Denver. That is also, it has a reputation, but it isn't always. 
a, uh, a conservative court, which, again, considering that uh, Mr. Gorish is filling the, uh, the, uh, the seat of uh, uh, Scalia, Scalia it's, it's an appropriate fit for him. The 11th Circuit is, again, Georgia, and the 12th Circuit is the D.C. Circuit. And the D.C. Circuit, in addition to hearing cases, because D.C. properly is, is not large, they hear a great many cases from federal agencies, whether it's the Federal Election Commission, the Federal Communications System, a great many other types of cases that arise in the nation's capital because that's where the federal agencies are. Uh, that's not to say that they hear them all. If, for example, there's some sort of a problem out in Denver about uh, violations of the uh, National Labor Relations Board, you can have a court of appeals here out in Denver, a complaint about strike breakers in, in Denver or something along those lines. So it's not exclusively federal agencies that appear before the D.C. Circuit, but that is the primary ones uh, that, that go there. Uh, uh, again, you can have an argument, or you don't have to have an argument. It's entirely up to the judges. Uh, if you have an argument, it's kind of an austere uh, business where three judges come out. You might have even seen it on PCN. Sometimes they show the Superior Court uh, proceedings, and it's all <laughs> legalese. And if they speak more than 15 minutes, that's a long period of time for an oral argument. Uh, and uh, again, the court will render a decision. It can publish a decision or not publish a decision. It's entirely up to the Court of Appeals whether they want to or not. The reason you publish a decision is to give guidance to the lower courts. Hopefully, in this type of situation, uh, lower courts, you're supposed to do this or not that or avoid this. So that's what a published decision, of course, the Supreme Court, uh, Mary Beth will tell you about, their decisions are guiding all courts courts of appeals, district courts, and sometimes guiding the states in terms of what the Constitution prescribes or, or doesn't prescribe. So that's the Court of Appeals. Beyond that, we go to the district court and with luck. There we are. Uh, Judge Knight was talking about the uh, high-paid lawyers from uh, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. They sometimes come to the Middle District, but they can keep to themselves. <laughs> because the Eastern District is Philadelphia. It's only six counties. The Western District is Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh-based. They may also sit in Erie, and also they established one for Altoona recently, within the last 15 years. Why Altoona? Because Congress said so. <laughs> why, did, why are there three district courts in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania? Congress said so. How many courts would there be in Minnesota, do you think? One. One. Why? Congress said so. How many courts in Iowa? One. Three. <laughs> How many in Oklahoma? Seven. Three. <laughs> Why? Because Congress said so. They set the number of judges, the number of district courts, where the district courts can sit, and they also have something to do with, at least on the Senate side, confirming those judges. So you can see the interplay, while the executive branch might start the ball rolling with a nomination, Congress says, judge, you'll sit here, or you won't sit. We have been blessed with judges in the Middle District. Uh, I used to practice before Judge McClure uh, and Judge Muir, and they were both excellent men, and I miss them. The present judge for the Middle District is Matthew Grand, who I think came from Cuyahoga uh, County, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, all the trials that we have are in Williamsport for this 16-county area. And you may have complained, like, geez, do I have to drive all the way up to Williamsport from Union County? Well, what if you're in State College? You go to Williamsport. What if you're in Berwick? You go to Williamsport. What if you're from the tippy-tippy top of the state of Pennsylvania on the border, you go to Williamsport. So again, Williamsport is the only place, if you, those of you who have been in downtown Lewisburg can see the beautiful old federal courthouse that was there. Uh, that no longer served 
the Middle District of Pennsylvania after 1986, and it wasn't because of Congress. It was because the judges didn't want to go to Lewisburg. <laughs> and that's a uh, sadness, but uh, again, thank heavens for Bucknell for taking it over. Uh, again, federal jury duty uh, is interesting, a little different than on the county level. Uh, first of all, there is something required by the federal government, or required of the federal government by the Fifth Amendment, the grand jury. You hear from time to time in the Pennsylvania system of special grand juries. They're rare. I don't judge night. Have you ever had a preside over a grand jury? Grand jurors, again, are required by the Fifth Amendment because if there's a felony involved, which is any crime punishable for a year and a day, it has to be presented to a grand jury. A person could waive their right to a grand jury presentation, but quite often they don't. The grand jury meets for about 18 months, and you can extend its term to two years. Many people that I have seen on past grand juries still remember me. I don't always remember them because all they have is grand juror, not their names on their, uh, <coughs> on their uh, uh, messages there. And uh, they are, uh, again, found it to be an interesting experience. You meet once a month, and it's a one-sided and that's the way the system works, presentation by the prosecutors. And after working with someone for 18 months, you get to know them fairly well. It has been said, and you probably even heard it on TV, that a decent federal attorney can prosecute and indict a hand sandwich. It isn't quite that easy, but it isn't all that hard either. And an indictment is only a set of charges, and Mr. Manafort is hoping that they're only charges that he's facing, that there's no substance to them, that that will be resolved later at a trial. Now, the other type of jury selection is pettit criminal jury. And uh, again, federal juries, is, it's a hard thing to predict. You can have a one-day jury, and you can have a case that I had, for example, from the beginning of May till about July 20th with another jury. Uh, and I can remember that one simply because it was a death penalty case. Uh, those are very, very extreme in their infrequency and in their seriousness. Um, but the federal courts don't stop just at the criminal matters. Uh, there are civil matters that are uh, also available in federal court. And Judge Knight strangely touched upon one of them in the sense that if you have an accident on Interstate 80, if you're from Ohio and you have that accident, you can file suit in Union County, trust Judge Knight to do the right and fair thing, or you can file it in federal court because of diversity of citizenship, because there are two different ent entities or interests that work, those of Pennsylvania and those in Ohio. And it was thought by Congress that diversity of citizenship is enough of a reason to allow a person, if they want to, to file a lawsuit in federal court. Federal courts also deal on the civil side of things with constitutional issues, anything involving a federal employee, anything involving a federal agency. Uh, those are the types of things on the civil side of things. And for example, uh, there was sadly a uh, wrongful death action up at the Allenwood uh, facility, which is just barely in Union County. And uh, because fellow accidentally ran into a poll gate, he filed a lawsuit against the Bureau of Prisons, and that was properly in federal court. You can also have a slip and fall on uh, the, at least at the time, uh, and, or, and still in Lewisburg, if you slip and fall on the post office grounds, it would be in federal court. So again, that gives you an idea. Federal agencies, federal questions, federal statutes, federal constitutional issues are all civil. And again, that's the type of court, uh, the counterpart to Judge uh, Knight. There is also a federal uh, magistrate court. We have a, up until, uh, uh, there, there are, I guess, three different kinds of federal magistrates. Uh, Full-time, part-time, and part-part-time. <laughs> and uh, for the longest time in Williamsport, we had a part-part-timer, uh, a very fine gentleman by the name of Askey. William Askey, 
And uh, he had normal offices, but you'd come in with a defendant and have an initial appearance and he grant bail or not grant bail, and then we'd go on to the district court judge. Now we have a full-time magistrate judge, William Arbuckle, who's up in Williamsport as well. well. What do the magistrate judges do? They do a lot of the preliminary business of the courts. They can do it on the civil side of things, they can do it on the criminal side of things. Uh, you'll always hear a person, uh, even Mr. Manafort, appeared in court first before a magistrate judge who set bail. Then he didn't like the terms of that bail, so he went to the district court judge thereafter. And that's, that's what normally occurs. Magistrate judges have very, very limited uh, authority. If you're trespassing on the grounds of the Allenwood Penitentiary or the Lewisburg Penitentiary, for which you can get uh, up to a year's imprisonment, the magistrate judge can hear that case. But anything more than a year, magistrate judges are, uh, it's with outside of their jurisdiction. So they can deal with the petty offenses, uh, such as uh, driving drunk at the Gettysburg National uh, oh. Park, <laughs> which sometimes happens if, uh, after a big battle. Uh, <laughs> and that's, again, what a magistrate judge would do because there are certain federal enclaves, such as the Allenwood Penitentiary, the Lewisburg Penitentiary, uh, uh, the, uh, and, and, and the Gettysburg National Park. Bureau of Prisons deals with the first two, the National Park Service deals with the last one. So again, that try, I'm attempting to give you a, a general idea of the uh, overview and the interplay. And one last thing, and again, especially with my esteemed former colleague, uh, uh, Peter Johnson, in the room, many federal offenses are also state offenses. You rob a bank, the feds can handle it, but Pete Johnson can also handle it as well. Who decides to do what? Uh, normally there is a good working relationship. It's not always the case, but there's a, normally a good working relationship with the local district attorney. And you consider, among other things, why should Pete Johnson prosecute the case? Or why should Fred Mark? Uh, and, and again, it depends on amount of penalties, it, amount of manpower put into the case, scheduling. So uh, again, prosecutors on the state and federal level should always work together. Doesn't always work, but that's the way it is. By the way, one last thing. Uh, again, you can see there's three places where the judges in, in the Middle District sit. In addition to Williamsport, Harrisburg, is the other area, and there are some fine judges down there. And of course, Scranton and Wilkes-Barre are the other two places. You will never have to travel to Harrisburg or Scranton or Wilkes-Barre. Williamsport is ours. <laughs> and uh, again, I hope you now have a better understanding of what your federal tax dollars are supporting. <laughs> kick it up a notch and talk a little bit about the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, oops, okay. The Supreme Court is important, as I talked early on about, within our system of government and that checks and balances, but it's also important to the individual lives of each of you here, so I believe. So I'm going to do a little bit of a test as well. Um, raise your hand if the answer is yes to any of the following questions. Um, did you drive here tonight? Okay. Do you have a cell phone? Do you travel internationally? Do you vote? Do you pay taxes? Do you have health benefits? Uh, are you an employee or an employer? Okay. And do you practice a religion? Have you attended school? Have you ridden in a school bus? Have you ever applied to college? Do you receive a pension? Um, do you care about protecting the environment? <laughs> do you care about how tax, taxpayer dollars are spent? Okay, the next group, don't raise your hand, but kind of think about this. Are you a member of what we would call a protected class? Are you over the age of 40? I think some people here may be. <laughs> are you a woman? We clearly have a group here. Are you a member of a union? 
Um, you identify as African American, Latino, Native American, LBGTQ. Are you disabled? Do you have a chronic medical condition? If you answer yes to any one of these questions, um, you've been affected by Supreme Court decisions. Um, the cell phone is the most interesting because that cell phone in your pocket or purse has a staggering amount of private information in it. And believe it or not, it's been a hot topic at the Supreme Court in the past, and it will be again this term. So um, the Supreme Court's decided presidential elections. I think we all need to think about that. It's had a great impact on each of us. Um, and this term, it's going to deal with some other issues um, that I know are of concern to members of the league, such as gerrymandering and voting rights. Um, so. The Supreme Court gets a lot of attention when it talks about divisive social issues. Abortion, privacy, immigration, gay rights, health care, race, gender, nationality. Or when it talks about constitutional issues, um, whether it be free speech, separation of church and state, gun control, stop and frisk, search and seizure. Um, but the reality is that every year the Supreme Court issues decisions that impact the daily lives of most Americans. Um, and it impacts not only important aspects of our life, but intimate aspects of our life. And it is the final authority on major issues in our country. So it's really important that we understand a little bit about this court and who is on it and what they rule about. So, I'm going to start in reverse and talk a little bit about the jurisdiction of the court, or the types of cases the court takes. Um, the Supreme Court has what we call original jurisdiction, cases that come to it initially. And those are cases between the states, because we don't think the states can rule on those, and cases involving foreign diplomats. The second type of jurisdiction is an appellate jurisdiction. That means cases come up on appeal. And those cases have to be one of two things. They either have to involve a federal law action or treaty, or they raise a constitutional question. It is this appellate jurisdiction that really fulfills that checks and balances, separation of power role we talked about earlier. So let's give you an example of a couple of Supreme Court cases that fit in that jurisdiction. So the original jurisdiction is cases between states. And this is one of my favorite. The question posed is, is Labor, Lady Liberty a Jersey girl? Now being from Jersey, that's an important issue. Um, in this case, believe it or not, um, there was a boundary dispute between New Jersey and New York as to who owns the middle of the Hudson River and what sits in the middle of the Hudson River, Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty. And it was always believed that New York owned that property. Who here would say New York owns that property? Most of you. Well, New York owns the initial three acres that were Ellis Island. But then the federal government came in, Congress, um, which we've heard a lot about, and they added 24.5 acres of fill to make this grand national park and expand what was going on at Ellis Island. Well, that property is in New Jersey. And New Jersey now has sovereign authority over the 24.5 acres. So yes, Lady Liberty is a Jersey girl. So that's a case decided by the Supreme Court under its original jurisdiction. Let's now talk about its appellate jurisdiction. That's where it would deal, one example is a case dealing with federal law. And I want to talk about the Tennessee Valley Authority versus Hill. And this case is about something called the Toledo Dam, which you can see here on the right is a picture of the dam, and was a test of the Endangered Species Act of 1973. It involved a snail darter. On the left, you can see a small fish, barely the size of your finger, whose only habitat was in the little river, the little Tennessee River, which was where the Toledo Dam was being built. And they only determined this was its only location nearing the end of the completion of the dam. So the Supreme Court heard the case, which was a challenge to the building of the dam, and it found that the law was valid, and it enforced it, and as a result, it stopped the construction of the dam to save the habitat of the fish. And back then, think about this, in 1978, it was a $137 million project that got stopped for two years. 
And in fact, Congress had to amend the Endangered Species Act two years later in order to allow the dam to be completed. So that's the power of the Supreme Court. Subsequently, the snail darter was found in some streams in Virginia. <laughs> but those things happen. Um, now let's talk about the constitutional cases that the Supreme Court hears. And these two cases are interesting for several reasons. One, I'm sure you've all been following the NFL and our national anthem, and it kind of reminds me of what happened in these two cases back in the early 40s. Um, these are civil cases, so constitutional issues can come up as both civil or criminal cases. We'll talk about a criminal case in a minute. Uh, Myersville School District is in Pennsylvania. And the children in the Gobitas family were being expelled from their public school for failing to salute the flag. And as Jehovah's Witnesses, they believed that saluting the flag was a form of idol worship that violated their freedom of religion. So the family challenged the school and saying that compulsorily saluting the flag would have been a denial of their First Amendment rights to free speech and to free exercise of religion. So that case went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled that yes, they had to salute the flag. Um, as it, it, the language is so interesting. They found as a means of showing respect for the flag as a symbol of unity, and as a means of preserving our national security, the children in that school needed to salute the flag, and it did not violate their religious beliefs. Now, the Supreme Court in the Gobitas case did not address the issue of free speech. And an interesting statement by the court was, the court refused to be the school board for the country. That was until they had Brown versus the Board of Education, <laughs> and they kind of decided differently. But, so let's fast forward to 1943, West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett. West Virginia passed a law, mandatory flag salute. Jehovah's Witnesses again came forward. The Supreme Court took the case, reconsidered it, and reversed its prior ruling. The court, in this case, the West Virginia case, held that uh, compelling the salute of the flag and the Pledge of Allegiance was a violation of First Amendment rights of free speech and did not at all address the freedom of religion issue. So it did the exact reverse of what happened in the Gobitas case. Um, the court said that the decision was made much more difficult because the flag was involved, much like we hear about the national anthem. And they both said, if you believe patriotism will only flourish if it's compulsory and routine, then we are underestimating the free mind of our nation. Um, and the decision was issued on flag day. <laughs> so you may say, what happened? And this is where it's very important when we talk about why are Supreme Court appointments important. So in Gobitas, it was eight to one. That judge, who was number the number one in the eight to one vote, Harlan Stone, in the interim, got appointed Chief Justice. Two new appointments were made to the bench, so that's three. And three justices changed their minds. Justice Black, Justice Douglas, and Justice Murphy. And Justice Murphy, in his biography um, that was written by one of his law clerks, said that not long after the Gobitas case, he told his law clerk, keep your eyes out for another case, because I'm very uncomfortable with our decision. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's really important that we understand that the Supreme Court can change its mind, and the important role that a Supreme Court appointment can have on that. The last case I want to talk to you about is a criminal case that also has a constitutional component. And this, again, you know, does the Supreme Court affect everyday people? This is Mrs. Atwater. These are her two children, and her kids played soccer. So she picked them up from soccer practice and drove them home and was stopped by the police. And she was arrested for not wearing a seatbelt and not having her children strapped in a seatbelt. When they arrested her, they handcuffed her, they took her to the police station, they photographed her, and they kept her in a cell for an hour until she made her $310 of bail. So by a 5-4 ruling, the Supreme Court found that the police did not, did not violate her constitutional rights under the Fourth Amendment to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures. So beware. 
that the Supreme Court can affect your everyday life. So this is the current sitting Supreme Court. New term just started in October, first Monday in October. The Supreme Court receives between seven and 8,000 petitions of cases to be heard every year, and they accept less than 80 for oral argument. Last year, they issued decisions in 69 cases. They had one of their most unanimous terms ever. 30% of all the decisions they issued were unanimous. Um, the most recent higher number was 39%. So it's a pretty good number. In fact, some people would say that today the Supreme Court is the least dramatic and most functional branch of the federal government. <laughs> it's probably true. Um, it's interesting, the, unlike the executive and legislative branch, they really function in private. And that assures their independence. Um, while oral arguments are open to the public and the press, there is no TV and no photographs. Um, they do sometimes live stream their arguments in larger cases. Opinions are issued months later after they hear the cases, and they rarely ever answer any questions from the media. What's in their decision is what stands. And they meet together, only the justices, on Fridays in what's called the Friday Conference, and no one else is allowed in that room. And the youngest, the youngest, the, the newest justice is the doorkeeper. And they begin every Friday conference with a traditional conference handshake. And that is kind of what they say that shows is that while they have differences of opinion, they have a harmony of purpose. So we've talked a little bit about appointments. These individuals are appointed by the president with what we call the advice and consent of the Senate. And they serve for life. Um, what the Constitution says is they serve for good behavior. Um, so. They serve for life and you can't diminish their salary, so that maintains their independence. Um, historically, historians would say the Supreme Court appointments are the most important a president can make. That while a president may be in office four or eight years at the most, the Supreme Court justices they appoint outlive them by many, many, many years and really impact not only the law of the land, but society as a whole. Um, of our current court, the longest serving is Anthony Kennedy, who's been on for 29 years. Um, while the average Supreme Court term is about 19 years, we currently have four justices who have sat for more than 20. Um, so a presidential appointment has a long and lasting impression. Um, a, a good example is Dwight Eisenhower, who was a conservative Republican, and he appointed probably one of the two most liberal justices of the 20th century. Um, Chief Justice Earl Warren and William Brennan. And in his biography, he claimed that his Supreme Court appointments were the biggest mistakes of his presidency. <laughs> um, we have a court of nine. When the court was first formed, it was six. But as of 1869, it's been nine. There have been 113 justices. Um, the first woman got appointed after 192 years. <laughs> Sandra Day O'Connor was appointed in 1981 to replace Potter Stewart. Uh, since then, there have been three additional appointments who are currently sitting, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Sonia Sotomayor, and Elena Kagan. And this is what reads over the entrance of the Supreme Court. It says, equal justice under law. And these words above that entrance really express the ultimate responsibility of the Supreme Court. Um, as the final arbiter of the law, um, the court is challenged with ensuring each one of you as Americans that promise that there's equal justice under law. And I think Judge Knight and Fred Martin would agree that both our state and federal courts try as well to issue equal justice under law. So that's the end of our presentation. We'll accept questions. I hope at the end of this evening you'll walk away understanding why courts matter. Thank you. Thank you to um, our wonderful panel. And now's your time to uh, ask questions. So if you have cards that you uh, have written some questions down on, hold them up and our ushers will get them and um, they'll bring them forward. Uh, they'll, actually, they'll be able to we'll group back there to review the questions and make sure they're not redundant. Um, so, but we have a couple of questions to start, and um, here, take, take the microphone over you there. Want to say it. Okay. You, guys, you guys can remain seated if you wish. 
Um, we'll start with, um, and this one is probably for Mary Beth, uh, what is the difference in the role of the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court from that of the other Associate Justices? Um, the, what they say about the Chief Justice is he's one among equals. So his real additional uh, responsibilities are administrative. He runs the federal court system. He's in charge of all federal judges. Uh, he runs the Supreme Court building, and interestingly, probably a fact most of you don't know, he's Chancellor of the Smithsonian Institution. <laughs> um, and actually, if you go way back to Melville uh, Fuller, he actually was instrumental in really making the, uh, the Smithsonian what it is today. Um, the only additional role the Chief Justice has is when he is in the majority on a decision, he gets to a point who gets to write that opinion. Um, the other interesting role he has is he sets the agenda for those Friday conferences. So he has a little bit of control over what courses, what cases are going to be discussed when and how frequently, a, you know, fast a case can move through the system. So this is for anyone who wants to jump in. What role, if any, does the judiciary play in reapportionment? Well, I think there's a role of state courts and a role of federal courts. Um, federal courts, uh, reapportionment cases, it's a very unusual system. It actually goes to a three-judge district court panel, which is not the typical. Usually there's a three-judge appellate court panel, but redistricting cases um, don't work that way. And then they come up to the Supreme Court. There's currently um, a Wisconsin case that was heard in early October. Um, we don't know what role the Supreme Court is going to play in redistricting. Um, up until this point in time, it has taken a position with respect to racial redistricting. Um, it has not taken a position based on political redistricting based on its decision in the Pennsylvania case about 13 years ago. But um, that issue is being re-raised this term, and um, the court's going to look at it. Um, we don't know whether they're going to decide they play a role, but it was a uh, a deeply divided court when the first Pennsylvania case was decided. Anybody else want to weigh in? We, we don't see okay. much of that. Okay, great. Um, can you sue a federal employee in the state court, and conversely, can you sue a state employee in the federal court? I'll try to take a shot at this one. Um, if the federal employee is not doing his job, if it's the weekend and he engages in some, or she engages in some misbehavior, that there's no problem because it's not considered as a challenge to the person who's a federal employee. It's just that there was a particular incident uh, when he wasn't a federal employee. If he is a federal employee at the time that he's sued, um, the federal government uh, has always the right to remove any case that's brought in state case at strict in state court to federal court. Why? The supremacy clause. And uh, again, federal courts have have it over Judge Knight. Uh, and uh, again, that's so. A, a, again, it depends on what the person is doing, what the nature of the act is, and. Uh, I'm not sure if you've had any experience with federal employees. No. no. If that helps to explain. Great. Okay. What continuing legal and professional ethics education is required of judges? <laughs> <laughs> well, as of just one year ago, um, the administrative office of the Pennsylvania courts, which is our boss for all all judges in Pennsylvania has mandated 13 hours of continuing education every year, of which three must be ethics. Um, and so we were all very, we knew this was coming, and you'd be surprised at how the, we, we always had had every six, continuing education every six months, but it was voluntary. Now it's mandated as of a year ago, and the, <laughs> the problem has become that there are very few facilities uh, at which we can gather that can house all of us now that we have to attend these programs. But it's a new thing. I mean, I think it's terrific. I always went to the conferences because I felt, being a judge in a smaller county, that it was harder for me to stay up on things. 
Um, I had, I mean, I had two other judges. We have three judges in our, I should say, two commission judges in the 17th Judicial District. And we have one senior judge, which is me. Uh, while I have opportunities to interact with my other judges, uh, it's not like being in Philadelphia County where you have, you know, 100 and some trial judges and several uh, sets of judges in each division uh, of the court. Uh, so the continuing education was very important for me to feel like I was well informed. But now um, we're all in the same boat, and I think it's great. It's very important. Great. I can't answer for the federal courts. I don't think the federal courts are required to have any continuing education. And, and again, once you're a member of the judiciary, uh, the rules are quite different. The most wonderful thing is having absolute immunity from suit. Uh, which court decisions are made public and which are not? Uh, I'll take one piece of that. I'll take another. <laughs> um, let me see if I can put this together. The larger county courts, the trial courts, the common police courts in Pennsylvania, uh, publish their decisions and have journals uh, to publish them. And they, it's an expensive process, so not every county can do that. And us, Snyder and Union counties, uh, we've looked into that, having our opinions published in um, a legal publication uh, on a regular basis, and we have just not found that we have a fight, you know, way financially to do it. Um, I think that the advertising that would be involved in a legal publication of our opinions would make it feasible, but there has been very little interest in pursuing that. Going to the appellate level, uh, the Superior Court and the Commonwealth Court uh, issue both published decisions in their reporters, uh, which are books available in any significant library, uh, and they also have the right to issue what are called memorandum decisions, which are they're available, you can get them at the court website, but you can't use them as guidance for any of the case decisions that you might make. So you have to be very careful. If you find an appellate court decision in Pennsylvania that's right on point and supports what you want to do, if it's a memorandum decision, you're not allowed to refer to it in your opinion. Uh, if it's a, an officially published decision, published decision, you can. The Supreme Court decisions are all published. Pennsylvania Supreme Court. So their decisions serve as precedent. They're readily available online or in the uh, official reporters. Um, so that's the way in which that works. It's up to the judge or the judges whether they want to or not publish. Um, many was the time when I worked for the Department of Justice where we saw a very well-reasoned opinion and the judge did not publish it, but then we would go back and say, Judge, you know, we would like you to publish this. Would you please do it? And frequently they would. Uh, again, the whole idea of publication is precedent. And the whole idea of precedent is for uniformity or some uh, hope of consistency. And uh, there are a great many unique cases that appear before judges, whether they're um, Pennsylvania or federal character that are just so unique that there's not much worthwhile uh, of, a, of a future president uh, to guide other courts. It's just kind of unique circumstances, and in that case, the judge simply won't do it because there's nothing to be gained other than uh, the self-aggrandizement that comes from publishing your own opinion. Yeah. All Supreme Court opinions are published. Um, in my experience as a federal law clerk is one of the reasons a lot of decisions didn't get published is it was a lot of time and effort to finalize those in a way that you would submit them for publication. So we kind of picked and chose, you know, we had a dissenting juror case. They pulled the jury and a juror descended. Like, there was no law out there on that case. That case got published. So unless we really felt we were making some new law or, or really changing or shifting some focus, we generally, I mean, we were issuing sometimes 20, 30 opinions a week. It was just way too much work. Pennsylvania has its constitution, as does every state. Which takes precedence in criminal matters, the Pennsylvania Constitution or the U.S. Constitution? Precedence, 
well, they both play a role. Um, and indeed, when you're asserting a violation of constitutional rights, let's say, in a criminal case, you will find that the attorneys reference both the federal constitution and the state constitution, which are not, and in terms of the uh, individual rights, are not exactly the same. And in some instances, the Pennsylvania constitution is more protective of certain rights in the federal constitution. So a good defense counsel will invoke every single constitutional right he or she can lay like his or her hand on. Um, in terms of precedence, um, the, the constitutions, I mean, the, the supremacy clause says that the federal, you know, the Supreme Court and the constitution are the supreme law of the land, um, and we would be junior to that. I'm just trying to think of a situation in which you would, I could point to a conflict where one would prevail and one wouldn't. I mean, you always defer, always defer to the federal, to the United States Constitution and to any decision of the Supreme Court. So, um, where we're, where if there were to be a conflict, that would be the outcome. But I can't think of a situation in which I'm not sure about the conflict issue, but when I was talking about, you know, whether Pete Johnson and I would do the bank robbery case, a lot would depend upon what the legal issues were. And as Judge Knight indicated, Pennsylvania is far more protective of its defendants than the United States is. So with that understanding, and if a Pete saw a case that might not be able to prevail in the courts of Pennsylvania and would constitute a federal crime, that would be one more factor that he would think about in saying, why don't you go federal with this one? So again, the, there's differences between the two, and what differences there are, it depends upon the facts of each case. Do all judges have to be attorneys? Uh, in, in Pennsylvania, uh, all judges in trial courts and appellate courts must be attorneys. In the lower courts, magisterial district judges, I think now they must be licensed to practice law. That was not true for a long, long time. Uh, and in a little interesting piece of history, uh, in 1968, Pennsylvania went to what we call a unified judicial system. And in that process got rid of an interesting little aspect of the Pennsylvania judiciary, which was that the trial courts sat with advisory judges who were lay people. Uh, so a trial court judge had us what they call associate judges, uh, and this was true in Southern Union counties, who over time were not called upon very often to participate in court decisions, but it was finally decided that that was something that was very outmoded and not a very good idea. So we got rid of the associate judges in 68, and now everybody in the trial court on up must be an attorney. And I believe I'm correct that the magisterial district judges now must be attorneys as well. That wasn't always true. The Constitution doesn't require federal judges to be attorneys. However, modern history has really changed that, and everyone's been attorneys for most of the time. And I don't know, actually, that anyone on, sitting on the Supreme Court has ever not been an attorney. It's just a matter of they read the law versus attending law school because there weren't law schools initially. Do the Pennsylvania Superior and Supreme Courts review and decide facts upon appeal, or are they confined to determining whether the lower courts correctly interpreted and applied the laws? The former. <laughs> no. Uh, they can't. They, they, appellate courts have very bad explained this. Appellate courts deal only with questions of law, and they also only deal with paper. Uh, there's no such thing other than the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, a case in an appellate court in Pennsylvania is all done with briefs and oral argument, and the, you know, the, client, the individual human being is not ever before the court. So. There is a way, I guess, of reviewing facts. Uh, it would be attacked on the sufficiency of the evidence, uh, and those uh, are frequently mounted and exceedingly rarely granted because the judges don't want to retry the case. Uh, they 
defer to the jury, and if there's any logical, reasonable way that you can defer to the jury's determination, that is what they will do. Could you discuss how Supreme Court justices make decisions? What is the role of the intent of the framers, the text of the Constitution, the ideology of justices, etc.? Oh my goodness. Who wrote that one? <laughs> <laughs> and, and if, Nobody's name. And if we all knew, we would all be yeah. uh, writing our next book. Um, you know, it, it, we could it, tell the future. It, well, it's the issue of the Supreme Court being non-transparent, and that's very intentional of our constitutional framers. Um, they really wanted an independent judiciary, and so their actions are very private. Um, and that was, I, I really do say, it's a complex system, but it's intentional. And so, um, you know, we've often, I worked in the press office. I mean, those people fought, have continued to fight for years for getting TVs in the courtroom. Um, and that is not going to change and not going to happen. And justices are not going to discuss their um, thought processes other than what's put in those opinions. Um, they're not giving interviews sometimes. You know, they'll speak at a conference and say something like, uh, Judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg said this summer at a conference at Duke that, you know, the gerrymandering case is going to be probably the biggest decision of the upcoming term. But comments like that are the most you get from them. Um, it, it's just not going to happen. It's, you know, I hate to say it. At, when I worked at the court, I got there right after the Brethren was published. And if you don't know what the Brethren is and you have read a book interesting recently. It's a great book about the Supreme Court. It was written by Woodward and Bernstein, who were all involved in the whole Nixon era issues. And it was the first tell-all about decisions of the Supreme Court. And they interviewed hundreds of law clerks and um, lots of back stories of the court came out. And um, after that, you like the reporters weren't allowed out of this little corner on the side of the building. I mean, like, you know, you used to go in the cafeteria and the justices were there with their law clerks. Like, it, it just, the place went on lockdown. I mean, because they were so concerned that so much had come out. Um, that was not the intent of the framers, and I don't think that's ever going to change. And we're not going to know any more than is published in an opinion. Okay, we'll end with another uh, hot topic. Um, what is your position on merit selection of judges versus the current practice of electing judges in Pennsylvania? Oh, we'll let Louise do that. <laughs> well, I hope we all each of us weigh in. This Pennsylvania is one of, I, mean, I don't know what the numbers are, there are not that many states that handle it the way we do. We elect our judges. Um, I think that the, I think the consensus is that works very well at the trial court level because that's where you're likely the, the citizenry, the voters are likely to know the people that they're voting for as trial judges. When you get to the appellate courts, it's a different story. And I, with this last uh, election, um, many, 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 five or six of my friends came to me and said, "What should we do? Uh, you know, the voting for the appellate court?" And what I told them was, and this is what I usually say, go to the Pennsylvania Bar Association uh, Judicial Election Commission and see how they rate these candidates. Uh, because I think they do a pretty good job of it. And they give the reasons uh, for the rating, which is you know highly recommended, recommended, not recommended. Um, and I go there because, I, honestly, I many times don't have any clue about these judges. They may have been trial court judges at one point, and then I really do have a feeling for what they're going to be like as appellate judges, but otherwise, I don't know. And most of the appellate judges come out of the big counties, um, out of Philadelphia County, Allegheny County, Pittsburgh, um, uh, Scranton, Wilkesbury area is, you know, the big counties where these judges uh, come from because it's very political. Uh, the thought has been that the, really the, the right way to go would be a, a blend of a set of candidates that are recommended uh, after being evaluated by a qualified body, which might include a combination of private citizens and uh, uh, other judges or lawyers, uh, and then have that, that uh, roster 
presented as the slate of candidates for election to appellate courts, um, I think in particular. Um, but it, it hasn't gotten any traction. Um, and I, you know, I think we're stuck with what we've got for the indefinite future. But I, it's a problem. I think you know, lots of times nobody has a clue as to what the appellate court judges are going to be like. And I'm sorry to say that there have been some episodes of less than stellar behavior on the part of uh, some of the appellate judges, uh, particularly in our Supreme Court, uh, where they have had to resign in disgrace. Um, and you know, the notion would be if they'd been better vetted before the election, uh, that kind of problem wouldn't have occurred. Federal uh, judges are selected through merit selection. It is no silver bullet. Uh, almost every federal judge has been involved either with a politician or the political scene. I disagree to a degree with Judge Knight about, and, and the bar associations are heavy into this. I was never a member of a bar association. Many prosecutors don't see the worth of bar associations. So when bar associations speak, they speak not for prosecutors. So the recommendation of a bar association is something to be taken, sometimes with a grain of salt. The, uh, I was reading well, this past week that a, there is a nominee for a federal judge in Alabama who's 36 years old. He'll have what, 34 years before he becomes a senior judge. Uh, he clerked for judges, did a lot of political action, and on his 37-page presentation that he makes to back up his merit selection, he failed to include the fact that his wife worked in the White House Office of Counsel. Wouldn't you, as a senator, want to know that this 36-year-old, and again, I'm showing my age, <laughs> this 36-year-old fellow, his wife works, and not that there's anything wrong with it. In fact, he should have been proud to say, my wife works for Donald Trump's Office of Legal Counsel. It wasn't there. What can you infer from that about the character of that person? Is that the kind of judge you would want to appear before? Just historically, the Supreme Court justices can only be removed by impeachment. And there's only ever been one impeachment, and he was acquitted. So there's never been a removal. So it's not an easy process to do. And I, I think Judge Knight and Fred are right. Um, neither process is a silver bullet. Um, we look at how few women are on many courts. The news this week was that our current president's appointments have all been white males. Um, not that you know. there's anything wrong with that. No, not, <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with that, but it, you know, it, it's kind of the whole thing of being, you know, tried by a jury of your peers. And, you know, a lot of the country would like to see people that look like them sitting on the courts, and, and we're not achieving that um, diversity as much as we had, and we're taking huge steps backwards. Um, so those issues are problematic, and I, I don't know that there's a right or wrong, you know, way to do it. Um, I came from a state that had merit selection. I think that worked well, but I think it can be said that there's a lot of political um, factoring. You know, New Jersey is a, a good friend of mine I clerked with was appointed to the Third Circuit as a judge, and she was held up for appointment because her husband, you know, had previously indicted Menendez during a prior uh, <laughs> indictment, and so he stopped her appointment for three years. You know, I mean, that's there, there's games played at all levels, and it's politics. Both parties. Right. And so I don't know that, I, I hate to say I don't know that there's a real answer to that question that we all can give you. Um, but get out and vote. That's an important one, and the league does a great job in keeping us informed about that. So, thank you all for coming. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I have some. I have some uh, closing remarks. <laughs> <laughs> First off, I want to thank our panel. Mm -hmm.
Marigan Park, Judge Louise Knight, and Fred Martin. And I want to thank you for all, from all of us for your service to our region and to our country. So thank you. I also want to thank the League of Women Voters and the Daily Adam for uh, being sponsors of this. This is a first time partnership with the League and the Daily Adam for doing these series of meetings. And um, I think it's been a wonderful experience. Um, a big shout out to Linda Harris and her committee. Uh, they've done yeoman work to get these four meetings going as well as a candidate's night, as well as a voter's guide, as well as you know all the other election service stuff. So it's been a busy fall. And I want to thank you all for coming and being here tonight and being interested in how our government works. Thank you.